Graham Brown's AM. Uh, Graham started life in, um, in Melbourne and he attended the University of Melbourne. Along the way, he attended Harvard University and went back to Melbourne and various cities, of course. But along the way, he did many wonderful things on, on behalf of all of us. And I say all of us because he's obviously a person who is dedicated to medical research, um, controlling disease, um, reactions to how we respond to diseases and so on. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful task that he has uh, taken on to um, work for our health and the health of the people in the world. In particular, um, and in, no, in no particular order, I should say, the, um, some of his accomplishments are um, as follows. He was the uh, James Stewart Professor of Medicine at the University of Melbourne, Head of the Department of Medicine at Royal Melbourne Hospital, Western Hospital, from 99 to 2007. He's worked in Tanzania and Papua New Guinea on his uh, assignments. <coughs> Head of the Division of Infection and Immunity at the Walter Elias and Hall Institute of Medical Research. He created the Victorian Infectious Diseases Services a service, I should say, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He concluded, uh, well, sorry, conducted basic research in immunopathology. I'm an engineer, I don't understand these things very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has conducted basic research um, on malaria, his special topic of the day. Um, he is an investigator on a research program um, devoted to mathematical modelling of infectious diseases. He's an author or co-author of 215 publications, and I guess they've grown a bit since uh, I picked up these statistics off the web. <clears throat> He's currently chair of the Malaria uh, Vaccine Advisory Committee of the World Health Organization. Um, I won't read the other list I've got here, but I'll just continue towards the end. Um, <clears throat> You didn't see me wink at you, did you? But he's, uh, he's currently chair of the scientific consultants group of the USA Malaria Vaccine Development Program. He has been an advisor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Children's Vaccine Program. He's the foundation director of the Nossel Institute for Global Health at the University of Melbourne. And in 2010, Graham was awarded the Order of Australia for his services to medicine. Uh, and particular infectious diseases. <clears throat> so we'd all agree that we are very fortunate indeed to have um, some of Graham's standing here in Melbourne, and particularly in Australia. Um, and uh, he, um, because we're, we're all like, very familiar with the way in which diseases or, or infectious diseases have uh, become more aware to us all in recent times. We think of the things like um, SARS and bird flu. HIV and AIDS, and drug-resistant um, diseases like uh, drug-resistant TB. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very much a thing that's all on our mind these days, it's in the media. <coughs> so um, Graham's topic for the day is uh, malaria, is with us, and what challenges, uh, what other challenges for control and elimination. <coughs> so please give uh, Professor Graham Brown a very warm welcome. about malaria from a relative who was perhaps in the Second World War or in Vietnam, or someone who's travelled, who's, or someone who's had to take malaria pills. Who's ever taken malaria pills in this room? <laughs> yes, we're very fortunate as Australians. How many have had malaria? Yes. Oh, well, these people who don't take their pills deserve to get their pills. <laughs> I happen to know the only two with their hands up. But, um, so that you'll have some understanding of the disease, which is helpful for the talk that I'm going to give. And what I'd like to do is give a little bit about the background to malaria, what the disease is, how it causes problems, 
and really try to give some insights at a global level how people are trying to tackle this great problem and the successes that are being achieved and then the task in hand. To understand malaria is to know that it starts with the bite of a female mosquito. And you can see this mosquito is just fed and it's got a um, stomach full of blood. Mosquitoes really want blood. The females need blood prior to laying eggs. That's why they'll keep buzzing and buzzing and buzzing and buzzing until they finally get that blood meal. So it's a very powerful drive to feed. And it's when they feed, as they uh, take the blood, that the malaria parasites enter into the person. And of course, after some period, they cause the person to be sick. That little parasite, the malaria that gets injected in by the mosquito, eventually ends up in the red blood cells of a person. So it breaks down blood cells. That's why patients become anemic. But they get a lot of fever and sweating. At the beginning, it's somewhat like the flu. And so this is a child who's sick with fever and sweating. And the way the malaria can be diagnosed is that this nurse is going to prick the finger and then examine the blood under a microscope. It's quite a, a technically difficult task to do. And here's a textbook picture of what you see. So here is the red blood cell. And within this red blood cell, you can see five of those little parasites within the red blood cell. They're actually different forms of malaria. Uh, this is the one that can, is most likely to cause death when it infects the brain or causes huge problems in pregnancy in the placenta. This one is perhaps not so serious but very common in our region and has the particular problem that after the first infection that the parasite can rest in the liver and come out a long time later. I remember it well because I went on a student trip to Papua New Guinea at the end of first year and I became sick in the August of third year, just before my exams. So it was 18 months after leaving the country. So the parasites had been in my liver all that time and for some reason came out and made me sick. And then here, these are the forms of the parasite, the sexual forms that are taken up by the mosquito when it feeds. So it's not just like blood to blood like you might have with him transmitting hepatitis or transmitting HIV, it's actually part of the life cycle back within the mosquito. Of course, if you injected this from one person to the next in a blood transfusion, that would make you sick. But this happens in the sexual stage, and that's in fact when you get sexual change, when you get all the different forms of the uh, variants. Like, all, say, you have all the variants in influenza, you get a huge number of variants also with malaria, which makes the challenge for your immune system. Now, here's some children in Papua New Guinea um, who have survived the earlier insults of malaria and developed a state of immunity. So these kids are just about ready to go to school. Would have Some of their uh, peer group might have died of malaria. Many would be anemic. But they've got a state of protection of immunity. They don't get too sick. I consider it's a little bit like, you know, many of us get cold sores. And you have a flare-up, and then it goes away, but it's still living somewhere in your body. And that's the same with malaria. So these children, if you examine their blood, you might find malaria, but they're not sick. They need, if they're constantly getting malaria challenge from mosquitoes, they retain their immunity. It's like needing your flu booster every year. But if they no longer get challenged with malaria, they lose their immunity. This is going to be an important part later in my talk. So if you have students coming to Australia from Africa or Papua New Guinea, where they've had an immunity such as these children have, and then they live in Australia for a few years with no malaria, and then go back, they're at risk of getting malaria. So it's a common thing that we know about. People going home to visit relatives have lost their immunity and become sick. And this will be important later in the talk. This is the rare but terrible complication of cerebral malaria. For some reason, this child, rather than getting a mild flu-like illness, is unconscious and has cerebral malaria. In the best possible treatment places in the world, 
this illness still has a, a mortality of perhaps 15 percent, even in the best hospitals in the world. And where resources are limited, the death rate is even higher. Now the reason that these children get cerebral malaria, this is in the brain of that child, this is normal brain here, and this is a very small blood vessel here. And you'll notice in this blood vessel, these black dots are malaria parasites within the red blood cells. So essentially they've clogged up the circulation in the brain and that's what's called the child to be unconscious. And that's what the very high mortality and the main cause of death in children when they die from malaria in Africa. There's a lot of interesting research and it happens to be an area of my great interest into this phenomenon as to why do these parasites stick in the brain. And just to give an idea of the way we study it, here are malaria, this is in the laboratory now, these are malaria-infected red cells. Now, normally these would be smooth, not unlike a donut surface, but probably those at the front can see these blobs on the surface, the knobs here. So the malaria parasite living inside the red blood cell has modified, and here you can see it sticking to another cell. And we think that's the process that leads to the complications in the brain. And we're studying what are the molecules involved in that interaction. And if you could block that interaction, you'd prevent this dreadful consequence. So young children at risk of cerebral malaria. Second group at risk is women who are pregnant. Probably 50 million pregnancies at risk every year. And it can have bad effects for the mother, but particularly bad effect for the child. The child's born at low birth weight and anemic and that leads to poorer prognosis in the first few years of life. So in many maternal deaths and the leading preventable cause of low birth weight in Africa. And just as we saw in the brain, the reason for this in the placenta, you're probably not used to looking at placenta, but this is the mother's side and this is the baby's side on the cord as you can see. And you'll find that the mother's placenta, all these black dots again are malaria, and they're interfering with the growth of the baby. So the way malaria causes that serious illness is blocking uh, blood vessels in your brain. It can also happen in the placenta, as we've shown, but also can affect lung and other organs. So that's why people die from malaria. The symptoms of fever and sweating and shakes are terrible and can be treated and usually don't have these consequences. And as a result of many episodes, you develop that immunity. So apart from people who are living exposed to malaria all the time, who gradually develop immunity as I've shown, we have other people who are suddenly exposed for un unusual reasons. This is a, a photograph taken from Papua, or what used to be Irinjaya, or the western side of Papua New Guinea. This is opening up forest areas for people to go and live there and resettle from other parts of Indonesia. Now, if you clear the forests and non-immune people from other parts of Indonesia come, these people become a serious risk of malaria, just as we would as tourists going to this in the first time. Now, there are particular challenges for it because it affects all ages. They don't come with any pre-existing malaria. And a big challenge for us is that the mosquitoes bite outdoors. I'll be explaining in a moment the control strategy that's used relies on the fact that a mosquito normally feeds on you in the evening, then goes and rests on the nearest surface. Or you've got a mosquito net that uh, prevents the mosquito from biting when you're asleep. So all our strategies depend on the fact that those mosquitoes bite at night. The problem here is that these mosquitoes bite outdoors and we don't really have an effective strategy to prevent that in large populations. We can't spray everybody with DEET three times a day for several million people at a time. So it's a big challenge for malaria control. Now, the most important strategy that has been used to control malaria is with insecticide spraying. You will all have heard of DDT. And how DDT works is it takes advantage of uh, what's, uh, what I've just said, the mosquito bites, then rests on the world. It's not like spraying with mortine to kill the mosquitoes. It relies on the fact that the mosquito bites, then goes and rests on the wall, injects and ingests the insecticide and dies. 
So, indoor house spraying with insecticide is the thing that's probably made the greatest difference in the big malaria campaigns in the past. Now, you notice this is a photograph taken about 10 years ago by a colleague, Jim Godding, showing these houses in India that have been sprayed, 1948, 49, 50. So, spraying once or twice a year was sufficient to control the mosquito population. Now, people of my age and older will, will remember the name Rachel Carson. <coughs> Rachel Carson, for the younger generation, wrote a, um, a very important book called The Silent Spring, in which she drew attention to the side effects of toxic chemicals in the environment. About that time, it was discovered that DDT can concentrate in the eggs of certain birds, particularly, I think it was an eagle. And this, if DDT concentrates, it's said to weaken the eggs, and therefore fragile, therefore reducing populations of these birds. And so there was a general outcry about chemicals in the environment, which was reasonable. But the reason for the, chemical, the DDT in the environment was not spraying houses, but widespread use in agriculture, such as crop dusting and spraying, acres and acres of field, where large amounts went into the environment. So you saw this huge environmental contamination, and then the idea was it had to stop. But in this case, it wasn't weighed up for the, per the use in this way to use it for saving lives. So what, following um, Rachel Carson and others, it eventually led to the fact that the main drivers of eradication were coming from the United States. There was pressure on them to stop using it. Then they said they would stop supporting programs that continued to use DDT in any shape or form. And so DDT fell down. And the problem was then the manufacturers stopped making it. And the alternatives are very, very expensive and not as good. So the world really has a big problem. There's only one or two major manufacturers of DDT at the moment, and they're in India. And there's a big campaign from people like us, like me, who would argue you have to weigh up the benefits to health versus the very small detrimental effect to the environment when used in this way. So when you see the debate in the papers, that's what it's all about. As, as the people who are trying to change this ban would say that every child who dies in Africa could be another Nelson Mandela or Yvonne Chaka Chaka. So if you're weighing it up in that way, it's a different way of thinking about the potential minor side effects of DDT used in this way. <clears throat> it is being, sprays are being used in other places. This is from the Pacific Island. I'm very proud to say that Australia's aid program supports activities in the Pacific, particularly Vanuatu, Solomons, Papua New Guinea. <clears throat> And these campaigns are very successful in reducing the burden of malaria. Relatively new thing, however, is studies over the last 20 or 30 years to show that the use of bed nets can prevent uh, death from malaria. Now, first studies that were done were that they gave bed nets to people, untreated bed nets, and then looked to see if the people under the nets had less malaria than those who didn't have an egg. And the answer was, indeed, they did. But what happened was then the mosquitoes simply moved from the net people to those without a net. So that if, if you're camping, the best thing is leave one of your friends outside the net, you'll be absolutely fine. If everyone's got a net, the mosquitoes keep hunting and hunting and hunting until they find the tiniest hole, they've got to get that blood meal. So it looked like a good idea, but didn't have its effect until Someone then said, let's um, impregnate the nets with insecticides. So once the net is impregnated with insecticides, indeed, it's both a deterrent and can damage the mosquito and lives can be saved in this way. It proves you have to actually do the experiments before making a public health intervention. <laughs> Remember the problem with um, the mosquitoes uh, outdoor biters? Now, you're not... Here's an idea for putting in hammocks that might be helpful. If someone's having their noonday nap, you could um, put insecticide in the hammocks here, and that might have the same sort of effect. But no one's found a way really to deal with these outdoor biting mosquitoes. You probably know that Bill Gates is really a sort of utterly brilliant and very nerdy guy, and they've supported one project which is sort of Star Wars-ish, 
where um, they've got someone who's got a sensor that's going around at night. The sensor can decide whether the flying thing is a moth, a fly, a mite, or a mosquito, then zaps it and kills it. Now, it's pretty amazing that they can detect the difference between these flying insects and kill the one they want to. It's hardly yet available for everyone to use, but they are indeed thinking. You know, it could be that you put some ultrasound around the village or some, some other way of doing it. So there's lots of interesting research being stimulated by the gates. So what do we have to fight malaria at the moment? Prevention, I've described nets, sprays, and of course you can give treatment to people at risk. Better management of cases to treat people early to prevent the bad complications. And then, of course, have mechanisms to detect cases and react quickly. But all these interventions require us to have a very good and effective health system to deliver it. And underlying it is the problem with the health systems. In Australia, for example, we had, we've got very effective and good vaccines. But people were simply not getting their children vaccinated until there were incentives for GPs to give vaccines. And then, when I think there was probably GPs in the audience, five or ten dollars per immunisation, is that correct? I'm looking I think at they've taken a lot of those payments away. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. people used to say you'll only get a doctor to read something if it's written on a cheque. I think that's very unfair. <laughs> but, um, but indeed, there's no doubt that incentives can work and you have to think of various ways to pass it through. Now, in a... Um, a developing country, it's the health systems that need to be improved. There's no good having a million mosquito nets ending on the wharf or uh, a 10 gallons of insecticide that doesn't get past an airport. And the health systems are the weak part of many aspects of life in developing countries. And so I'm not going into it here, but there's a huge amount of work that's not particularly glamorous, but trying to look at the systems for delivering these important interventions. At the heart of it is well-trained people, good people who understand the systems, know how to, what they're supposed to be doing. They've got to have good information, they've got to have appropriate medicine and technology, it needs del delivery and service and financing, but above all, governance with a good structure, no corruption, to make sure that the right services get to the right people. So for example, there's a big problem at the moment with fake anti-malarial drugs. So people are taking the real thing, perhaps selling it privately, and substituting. That's one example. We all hear of some of these aid programs where money is taken as a converted from a service fee. Uh, where the head of the organisation might be Mr. 10% or Mrs. 15%. The service fee, we all know the way business is done. We've seen it in Australian companies in various things in the newspapers. So getting the governance right and the accountability is indeed very challenging, as it is in Australia. Just to make that point, this is a real life example from 2006 trying to treat people in a community with the appropriate drugs for malaria. So there's a drug that if you give it in hospital under supervision, 98% of the people will completely and properly treat it. But let's say only 60% of the children actually have access to it. The diagnostic test only 95%. The person doesn't the compliance with the appropriate treatments only 95% is pretty good, and the patient takes it about 70%. You've got to multiply all these up. So 98% efficacious drug, its effectiveness is less than 40%. And so getting this system right is a huge challenge when we're talking about health systems to deliver such intervention. It doesn't matter if it's AIDS, TB, malaria, nutrition, vaccinations, immunisation, management of tuberculosis, they all require a functioning system, which in a country like Australia, we take for granted. So where are we at with malaria? Well, it's really a pretty good story, strangely enough. Although there are 216 million cases per year, all malaria deaths are now thought to be between 500 and 900,000 year, per year. That's an awful lot. But considering 20 years ago, it was probably double that number at least. It's a demonstration what can be done. When there is a will, there is a way, and I would say that a huge yeah. stimulus has been the gate. Bill and Melinda Gates, personally. This isn't their company, it's them saying to the world, get on and do something. So the figures are getting better and better, but 
the reduction in deaths in 10 years is about 17%. It's too slow, of course, but it's better than we were seeing prior to that. So what it's saying is there's still a huge problem, but we need to do better. And of the cases of malaria, most of them are in Africa, and most of the deaths are in Africa in children. And the good thing, the cause for optimism, is that the malaria map is shrinking. If you'd looked 100 years ago, there's malaria in virtually every country of the world. It's thought that every country had malaria, with the possible exception of a few Polynesian islands over here. So that, for example, in, in 1940s, all around Europe, and of course Australia wasn't declared malaria-free until 1950, and of course there was malaria in the southern United States, still persists in Mexico, mm -hmm. so the map is shrinking. And a lot of countries are now at the stage where they're getting finally to get rid of it completely and utterly. And so, in certain African countries, and these are figures looking over the, a five-year period, have reduced by 50%. Not just in, in places where malaria is marginal, but hard to name places, Rwanda, Zambia, Eritrea, where malaria was a major problem. So the deaths from malaria come down, but and both deaths, number of cases, and all causes of admission to hospital. In a malaria season, a very high proportion of the medical services are going simply to treat malaria. And so when we look at how, does, how do you go about getting rid of malaria, we tend to think of stages. A control phase, when we're really trying to reduce the number of deaths, then getting down to relatively small numbers, um, where we're uh, trying to track every case, and finally, elimination of malaria from a country or a region, and then the challenge is to stop it coming back. And in our region, the Western Pacific region, a number of countries are, are getting close to these areas. And there's a group supported by Australian aid, Australia, Asia, Pacific Malaria Elimination Network of countries that are very close to eliminate countries such as Korea, parts of Indonesia, parts of Malaysia, and it would be terrific that we're supporting these countries because quite apart from the, the burden on deaths and illness, there's a huge economic cost. It's estimated for Africa, for example, that um, countries with malaria are likely to have a 1% reduction in GDP simply related to the burden of malaria and economic losses. So if your gross rate is 3%, malaria will make it into 2%. So it's a huge difference in output attributable to uh, this one disease. So what's interesting is this is to highlight, those at the back, this is a picture of Bill Gates and Melinda Gates who said three or four years ago, we should, we should consider trying to eradicate malaria. People thought they'd gone completely mad. They said it's impossible, it can't be done, you'll never do it. They said it's intolerable to even consider that for all time we should have a world that still has malaria. When we've got the drugs, the treatment, the systems to get rid of it, it's intolerable. So they then put forward a lot of money to say what do we need, what would we do if it takes 10, 20, 30, 50 years, what would we need for drugs, for vaccines, systems to do it? A major stimulus to the field and it's their activities that have contributed to this decline by putting their money and encouraging others to do so that have been so important. But why were the scientists so sceptical? The scientists were sceptical because in the 50s and 60s there had been a program, the Malaria Eradication Campaign. Now, they eradicated malaria from many countries, Italy, Spain, North Africa, Southern Europe, Southern United States, many, many countries got rid of malaria, but they didn't achieve their final goal of eradicating malaria from the globe. Therefore, and unfairly, it was considered a failed campaign. It's really unfair in the fact that so many countries were declared free, but the campaign failed. And it was that that people said, this is ridiculous. And part of the reason this slide tells the story that backs up their great concern. We've talked about DDT, and in 1946, DDT was introduced in a widespread way in Sri Lanka. The death rate fell from 20 per thousand to 14 per thousand. By 1956, it had gone down from 3 million <coughs> cases to 7,000 with no deaths over 10 years. In 1964, Sri Lanka stopped using DDT, malaria is sold. What happened? Five years later, cases rose from 17 to half a million in one year. The gains of those years were lost within two or three years for exactly the reason the point I made before. If people 
the best, in a way, the best way to become immune to malaria is to have lots and lots of attacks as a child, and if you survive, you're then protected from dying of malaria for the rest of the life, provided you're constantly being boosted by infection. In this case, there was no malaria there for several years. People totally and utterly lost their immunity, and there was a resurgence. And it's the people who were thinking back to this day who said, we can never do it. Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates say, sure, we know about that, but we've moved on, we've got better tools, better surveillance, and it's still worth trying. Others said, we shouldn't be spending this money trying to eradicate malaria, there are other more important priorities. And when you're getting down to very, very few cases of malaria, obviously it's not a big problem to the health system. No, practically no one's getting malaria. Like where we were in the Solomons, there's a couple of islands that are trying to eradicate for all time. They hardly get any cases, whereas over here, there's tons of malaria. And the people say, why are you spending money here where there's no malaria? So explaining the message that you've got to do this to prevent a Sri Lanka situation is a hard public health message to get over. Why did it re-emerge? First of all, there was a loss of political will, the recognition that they needed to keep. Mission was not really accomplished. The pro programs had broken down and all pe people of all age were susceptible. DDT was falling into bad repute. I can't remember exactly when Rachel Carson's book, but I guess late 60s, perhaps? Yeah, 64. 64, was it? And then drug resistance became a problem and increased insecticide resistance. So all those factors are what could interfere with what's um, to be done now. So what the um, Gates <coughs> stimulated the global malaria community to get together and work together. And they formed a partnership which they've called Rollback Malaria. Instead of having different groups doing different things, they said, let's bring everyone together in a global partnership. And it's quite interesting to hear how this type of thing works. So what they did, they had a group of agencies. Obviously, the malaria endemic countries, critically important. There were major funders that include the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria, a major donor, UNITAID. This is a, a funding group from Europe. A very innovative health minister in France put a tax on all airline tickets, one or two dollars or something like that, that goes into a fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria. And then a representative from the, um, you know, a representing Ban Ki-moon from the UN. Then there are donor countries, and I'm very pleased to see that AusAid is in there, but also the US is a big donor and particularly differed from the UK. Multilateral agencies, United Nations Development Program, UNICEF and others. Lots of non-government organisations make huge contributions. And many will know the work, for example, of Rotary Against Malaria. Private sector supporters, various foundations such as the Gates Foundation, and then the group I represent, Research and Academia, those of us who are working. And that group works together to make a global plan that everyone's signed up to and more or less assigning tasks. Medicines for Malaria Venture, your job is to develop new drugs because we know resistance is a problem. Vaccines group, you work on this. This group works on procurement. This work on that. So we more or less parcel out the different pieces of work that need to be done. And it's a framework that's been in action at looking a long period and all these institutions have signed up. The plan is such as I described as happening in the Pacific. Control, scale up for impact, sustain, then eliminate. At all stages, research will be required. The challenges. The challenges we have, the funding gap. It probably needs about six to eight billion dollars per year to control and maintain the gains so far. That sounds quite a lot of money. But it's very, very, very small, as I'll show you, in comparison with other things that the world chooses to spend its money on. Um, the coverage with existing tools, how do we make sure that everyone gets a net, everyone gets a test and everyone gets the drugs? And then resistance. We know over the years resistance has occurred both to the parasites, we've been those of you who first went away 50 years ago probably took chloroquine and then maybe 30 years ago you took fentanyl and 10 years ago you took mefloquine and now you're probably taking something else. Um, so there'll be a, we know that resistance comes for those who don't work, like you know 50 years ago if you had a golden staff you could use penicillin. Well, we can't, that doesn't work now. Then 30 years ago you took 
Proxicillin, that doesn't work now. Now you use vancomycin, now they're resistant. It's a natural balance of the parasite and the environment that it's adaptable. That's how they survive. And also resistance of the mosquitoes. And these are the costs recommended, as I said, about six billion per year. And with the global financial crisis, this is really falling. Um, an American friend gave me this, and he had seen a program on television. I remember my figure for six billion dollars, and he said, "Compare global health financing to costs of other initiatives. Have a guess how much U.S. troops spend on air conditioning for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. More or less than six billion dollars." $20.2 billion annual spend on air conditioning. That was on National Public Radio, and he said it hasn't been disputed. Think what you could do with $20 billion. Some other priorities of great interest to the Nossel Institute for Global Health. Basic education, perhaps $6 billion, which is what I've said from there. Cosmetics in the US, $8 billion. Ice cream in Europe, $11 billion. Narcotic drugs, $400 billion. 50 billion of cigarettes. Pet food in the Europe, 17. Why do we allow it to happen? Oh, it's all different budget, different budget. Why don't we care? Mentioned about drug resistance, and our area of the world is a hot spot for drug resistance. It's been detected particularly on the border, Thailand, with Burma here, all around Tala, Cambodia, and it's a great concern. Because this drug, artemisinin, um, is probably the best we have when used in combination and there's great concern that resistance is developing there. And once it's introduced, it obviously spreads pretty rapidly. I'm sorry for this slide, but it tells you uh, a story. The title is Increased Proportions of Outdoor Feeding Among Residual Malaria Populations of Mosquitoes When You Use Nets. What this paper showed, remember the strategy, um, the mosquito comes in, bites you and rests on the wall. They've been following mosquitoes when they put all these nets out. And in, what the mosquitoes are doing, some have become chemically resistant, but others bite you, fly out the door and rest on the tree. So all the insecticide on the wall, no use at all. So if those mosquitoes either change their time of biting to before you go to bed, or rest on the trees, your whole strategy's failed. A good example of biological adaptation that needs to be followed and somehow dealt with. This is some of the wonderful work going on in the Solomon Islands where some fantastic programs in this island that hasn't been any malaria there for a couple of years as part of one of these strategies to eliminate. Vaccine work, I haven't got time to talk about that, it's a more technical talk, but the aim for the malaria vaccine would be perhaps block, this is what comes in from the mosquito, stop it coming in, this is in your blood, this would stop you from getting so sick, and this is to stop it going, being infectious by the mosquito. So all sorts of strategies are currently being used to deal with the vaccine. And the best, most advanced vaccine is showing something like 40% protection in children against serious illness over a period of about three years. That's optimistic. It's not as good as we want yet, but it's certainly very, very promising. Other tricks are being used to make better vaccines by putting genes from malaria into viruses. So you can then give the virus to an animal. So for animal studies, that also gives some protection against malaria. This is applying the new technology to new ways of making vaccines. Terribly important, we remember that people were so critical to the future successes in those countries. Nothing about us without us, I think, is a very good um, mantra when we're working in population health. And we need to work with communities as well as national <coughs> programs. So in summary, I think the last decade has been seen real resurgence in efforts, partly starting with the Gates Foundation, but then tremendous input, particularly the US government. 20% reduction in the last 10 years is pretty terrific, but there's a long way to go, and we must maintain those gains. We're continuing to contribute to the funds to make it possible. A vaccine is probable in the medium term, but not yet magic. I've mentioned about Bill and Melinda Gates calling for eradication, and I thank you very much for your attention. Welcomes questions. Lots of uh, burning subjects there. And please. Is it reasonable to draw a parallel to something that's a bit closer to home where we've got a, a, an increase in the number of whooping cough cases 
coming from a complacency and resistance to infant immunisation. Um, I think that that is a good parallel with the fact that after being immune, your immunity certainly wanes. And so it probably, some people are saying that perhaps you should have a booster for whooping cough, and as you'll know, that's often recommended for grandparents and parents uh, who are looking after young children to prevent it. I have some paediatricians in the audience who'd answer better than I would. And it certainly, if you don't see the disease, you, don't, you forget about it and immunisation should continue. I think that perhaps the whooping cough's coming back for a couple of reasons. Perhaps that there's more transmission against old, about older people and also perhaps um, immunised. Frank Shan, do you want to comment on the whooping cough just quickly? Yes, there needs to be a routine program for immunising adults because all adults are susceptible to whooping cough. You get it many times in your life. And we need to have a routine program for 10 yearly immunisation. So you're right, the waning immunity. Can I, please? Oh, yes, we'll take Bruce and the lady in front next time. One thing I've got to say is I had a wife, and I thought she was pretty nice at the time. And she went away and lived with my brother in New Guinea and came back with the, to all those diseases you described. And today is a very special day. Sorry to bring it to you, but it's the 4th of July. It's also that day in 1776 when the anniversary, or whatever it was, the whole starting point was America against Britain. They said, no, you can't charge us any taxes like that. We'll make our own taxes. If you insist on that, that's all. But by the by, my wife came back with uh, malaria and she insisted upon having a few pills. I'm not sure how good she was. How can I say? What's that normal? A, very, a good observation because maybe the pills were good to protect her from the infection in the blood, but maybe it came from the liver. But to go back to the War of Independence, do you remember I said about how you become immune? The locals there had lots of malaria and were relatively immune. A tactic of warfare was to delay an invading force long enough until they all suffered with malaria. <laughs> and that happened in, in the West Indies as well. And of course, uh, it was a big problem to the troops in the Civil War. And as it was, I thought we might refer to Papua New Guinea, of course, uh, well, slim in Burma, but in um, Papua New Guinea, it was the excellent work of the Australian Army Malaria Research Unit that worked out how to prevent malaria with drugs and it was an offence, actually, if you got malaria. So in fact, I believe, I don't have the numbers in my head, someone else may, but there were more casualties from malaria than there were from bullets. Even Alexander the Great probably died of malaria. Um, my query is, what's being done about fake and diluted drugs? It's, it's an absolutely huge problem to know how to deal with that. There's been a controversial scheme by which um, people saying that in the public sector, you can probably, when you give drugs and you, they're quality controlled, they're probably okay. In the private sector, some are arguing you should subsidize quality drugs into the private sector to make sure that good drugs occur in the private sector. Mm -hmm. One of the troubles to show just how hard it is, you might know that for certain conditions, you take two drugs to stop resistance coming. It's been policy from rollback malaria for many years that companies should not sell monotherapy, but they continue to do so. So we've got problems with quality monotherapy because it's wrong. We'd never think of treating tuberculosis or HIV with one drug. One way people are thinking that could be done, could you, for example, have a rapid test where let's say you've got 20 pills that the pharmacists or someone else could crush one and did stick test and see does it contain the ingredient. But it's a real, real problem under treatment. Um, what's the research uh, with regards to genetic manipulation of the parasites and or the mosquitoes, if any? Um, genetic manipulation. <laughs> I mentioned to you that multiple infections in children makes them immune. So people are saying, why can't we make a living attenuated malaria? So, for example, I showed where they cause trouble is where they stick with the knobs. 
what if you genetically manipulated a malaria parasite so it couldn't stick? <clears throat> so you'd become immune, but you wouldn't have the pathology. People are tackling that in one way in order to think another approach will be if you take infected mosquitoes and put x-rays through them and then feed the mosquitoes on people, the mosquitoes can't, sorry, the parasites can't get out of the liver, but that's enough to make people immune. So attenuated parasites is one way of approaching it. But the most amazing stuff that I think is happening is within mosquitoes, and this is work being done here um, by Scott O'Neill, Ari Hoffman and Cam Simmons, who's coming to work at the Nossal Institute. It's been known for a long time that the microbiologist will tell you about this, but when you're trying to keep mosquitoes growing in the laboratory, from time to time they get a funny organism that grows in them. It's called Wolbachia, so-called commensal organism. You know, we've all got lots of bugs in our guts and our skins and everything. And these commensal organisms were just really a nuisance in the laboratory. What they found, however, was that when they took the Wolbachia infected mosquitoes and fed them on dengue blood, they were not infectious. In other words, an intercurrent infection in a mosquito prevented the mosquito from having the ability to transmit dengue. Do you understand what I've said? Mm -hmm. So then you say, what they've done some release of these things, and they've done this, I think, in Queensland, and these infect, well, back infected mosquitoes have some sort of survival um, advantage transmitted to the next generation, so it gets better and better. They're now trying to do the same sort of tricks for those mosquitoes that carry malaria, which will reduce the ability of the mosquitoes to transmit malaria. So when you add that to your nets and your drugs and all that, it might be effective. Now, I know I'm in dangerous territory, but so many microbiologists in this room, and doctors and others who know more than I. Have I got it roughly right, Jenny? <laughs> Tick from my former tutor, so. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more questions? Uh, that's all. All right. Oh, sorry. One more. It's like uh, last one. Um, I wonder: is there a need for more crosstalk between programs? For example, the uh, the campaign against pneumonia, recommending routine use of cofrenoxazole, almost certainly increased resistance to cancer. Mm -hmm. I worry greatly that um, WHO are now recommending routine malaria prophylaxis with vaccination in sub-Saharan Africa. With Cotramoxazole or Fancela, and that that will increase resistance against the, amongst uh, the organisms that cause pneumonia. And I'm not sure the two programs are talking to each other. What can we do about it? Just to put it in a framework for others who don't know, Professor Shan, who's a world expert on paediatric child health in developing countries, and particularly with respect to immunizations and vaccination, has hit on a really, really important. Um, point about this. The other thing just to remind you what is WHO? WHO is its member countries and a WHO position is really a group of people like Frank and me or Jenny or others coming along sitting to do what we think is the best of, uh, in the light of available evidence. Now we're referring here to, let's tell you from the malaria side, I mentioned that one approach is to say okay let's give all the children a bit of anti-malarial to stop them getting very sick. When you do that on that study, what you show is that by giving children regular, say monthly, anti-malarials, it reduces their chance of dying. But the price you pay is that you might have tremendous increase in resistance. And then, you, that study looks good, but then you do it in a more widespread way and you end up with untreatable malaria a few years later. It's been incredibly um, controversial to say that this should happen. There are people totally for it and others totally against it. And it's become further complicated when people said pneumonia is probably the most common cause of death and it's a relatively safe drug, give it to all the kids. And this happens to have some effect against malaria. So inadvertently, a kind of unintended consequence, you could be hastening resistance. Now what happens when everybody comes together in a room to say, what should we do? There's huge debate about it but who's going to decide? Who's going to be the judge of what should or shouldn't happen? Preferably, if you could say, I've got a drug for pneumonia or for prevention of malaria, 
and those drugs are completely different from the drugs that I use to treat pneumonia or treat malaria, you're probably on safer ground because you've reserved your treatment to where you should need it. But I would totally agree with Professor Shannon that talking together in what we call an integrated management of childhood illness, because a, child, a mother brings a child with fever and sweating, it could be many different things. It's not satisfactory to say that's not malaria or that's not pneumonia, because in the end, a form of treatment is required. So what we're arguing for, and a big push in malaria, is to make a test. Remember I mentioned to diagnose malaria, you've got to take some blood, put it, look under a microscope. If you could have a dipstick test and say, yes, it is malaria, we treat you, or no, it's not, and you avoid the antibody, if you had a rapid diagnostic test for malaria and for pneumonia, which was 100% correct and never wrong, you would be in a good position to do that. So the testing is a very important part of use of drugs. So it's diagnostic and testing. People say we need a theragnostic reagent therapy and diagnostic, which might, and I think you'd agree with you with pneumonia, it's equally difficult to be sure whether this child has pneumonia now, or perhaps is not too bad now, but by tonightfall, when they've gone home, might be much worse. Sorry, that's all too long. That's okay. no, I think that everyone, um, Captivated. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, here, here. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I think um, what I've got out of Graham's presentation is uh, that we in Melbourne don't really know about, I suppose, very well, I'm not just speaking on behalf of myself, know very much about malaria because it's just not in our area, it's not in our society in any so it's off our radar. And yet we've learnt that it's certainly very much a, a very serious worldwide problem. There are millions of deaths every year. Uh, I think the other interesting point that uh, I saw was the um, amount of money which is required to run good programs in the world compared to how much we spend on cigarettes or ice cream or whatever, and that was just European ice cream, but as Kerry said, European ice cream is apparently very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> nevertheless, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's small money. Um, American Defence Forces, with their amount they spend on air conditioning, similar story. The analogy and the comparisons are um, very stark indeed. But uh, question, I guess, all of our priorities in society on a number of fronts. So um, I think with that, I don't really need to say very much more to you for your terms of appreciation because I know that everyone here joins with me in um, being mesmerised by your clear presentation and logical explanation of the, the frontiers of which we face. And, and, and so here we have uh, probably one of the, well, not known to you, I suspect, one of the better um, repellents for mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, when, you, when you partake so much of this, two things benefit, uh, benefit immediately occur. One is you can't feel a mosquito sting you. <laughs> and secondly, when the mosquito flies away, they can't fly in a straight line. <laughs> so, so we would like to um, present this to you and I hope that you enjoy it. Mm. enjoy each other's company and, and, and enjoy the day. Thank you much for coming. And again, a reminder if I could for Monday night, the council really does need your um, advice and wisdom and thoughts on Monday night. We, we have a, a dilemma. Uh, so um, the more members that can come along to listen to the issues and get us guidance, we very appreciate it. So thank you very much everyone. <clears throat>